You're recording. What you say can and will be used against you. In a court of law. <laughs> no, for blackmailing purposes. <laughs> yeah. All right. How do I screen share? Let me see. I was young. I needed the work. No. <laughs> All right, so Ruthie, why don't we start off tonight? And okay, you leave. We'll start off with me in case I, I leave. The Eternal One spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ritual law that the Eternal has commanded. Instruct the Israelite people to bring you a red cow without blemish in which there is no defect and on which no yoke has been laid. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest. It shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. The cow shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, flesh, and blood shall be burned, its dung included. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson stuff and throw them into the fire consuming the cow. The priest shall wash his garments and bathe his body in water. After that, the priest may re-enter the camp but he shall be impure until evening. The one who performed the burning shall also wash those garments in water, bathe in water, and be impure until evening. Another party who is pure shall gather up the ashes of the cow and deposit them outside the camp in a pure place to be kept for water or lustration for the Israelite community. It is for purgation. The one who gathers up the ashes of the cow shall also wash those clothes and be impure until evening. Now, is this the red cow? Is this um, yeah. something about- Yes, this is the, the red diet? cow business, yeah. Wow, all right. So let's move on. Okay, should I continue? Okay. All this shall right, be I have, okay, I have a question for you guys. <laughs> what does the word purgation mean? Uh, I thought we went over this before. I thought purgation was some type of burning thing. To make, yeah, in right. the purifying of the burning. Ah, down. okay. Now, now you got it. Not, not burning, but either purification or cleansing mm. of something. Oh, cleanse. Okay. It wasn't the. In, it, it's not a purgation. It's not a purifying through fire. I thought it was. Okay. Oh, no, but not, not, not through, not through fire. In other but words, you can purify, okay. but not through fire. Okay, you know, I think you have to have a strong stomach to read these things. I get so upset. And I mean, you, I know you can't that take the... it so literally. It, you know, you get oh, it is all... literal. That's how they did it. Well, you know, we yeah, we always talk about how barbaric the whole entire world was. And here people are trying to follow God's words. And I think that there's a lot of taking the old school and mixing it with the new school, like this whole idea of giving uh you know sacrifices to god and things and then we learn later in the psalms that god's not really happy with sacrifices no. god wants mercy so um, uh -huh. this is important and i think so i think it's all part of an involvement of how we are we were more barbaric like you said michael mm -hmm. and then as we start to uh, evolve we become much more um uh, human like I don't know what the word is of um, yeah yeah Civilized. and I just it's like think it's all part of but you see I don't when I read this it might help you Myrna when I read this I don't take this like I don't take this literally I take this as understanding purification understanding that they're doing something to make it higher than they're used to so when they have to do all these laws it's to make them understand that you can't be the way you used to be and so we're trying to get you into a higher uh, level of, 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 of spirituality. That's the way I look at it. I don't, well, look, I don't take everything literally, you know? Well, I, I do think that this is literal because they had certain laws and things to go by. And this is this was a, a specific thing for them. It's just that yeah. I have problems reading it because it, I feel it gutturally and it's not a good feeling. Let, let us remember that these rules and regulations were in force up until the destruction of the second temple in the yeah, year. Yeah, we talked about that. Mm. Yeah, that? and then we didn't have the sacrifice anymore, right? Yeah. And I the mean, other like, thing is, too, that we, we, um, we eat animals, I mean, which doesn't to me seem any less 
hurt and sacrifice That's true. Someone. That's true. And we kill and them, back, you know. Yeah. And back in those days, people were more, you know, if you were eating something, you were likely to kill your own food. Whereas nowadays, you just go to the drive-up window with Taco Bell or something <laughs> like that, you know? <laughs> Back then, you had to actually do it, you know. Yeah, and so, so people, that was much more to us difficult. now. It seems it who seems a prophet? lot more barbaric. Who was the prophet? Was it Amos who said God does not want your sacrifices? Yeah, I it, think it was no bird offerings anymore. The, he wanted you, but not you know the, right. that. Was the, the, the the growing up kind of thing. Yeah, uh, well, that's I just say it's an involvement and. I, I don't some, somehow or another. I, if I was to take every word and think about it and digest it as part of me, I I can understand you being upset, but I try not to do that. Well, I have to tell you, I think it's a it's um indoctrination. When I was a little kid, and my mother would come to Lynn with me, I didn't realize it, but all those chickens that were in the coops were yeah. my mother would pick the one out that she wanted. And the shepherd would go through this thing and and kill it, kill yeah. the poor chicken. And we take it home. My mother would kosher it and all that kind of thing. And I don't think, as a kid, I I really connected what was happening and that I was eating what I saw killed. I think I may not have ever had chicken soup and chicken ever more if I had realized. Right. You know, I understand. Well, that's the point, though. So it's interesting. As a child, you didn't really connect with all that. And now you're connecting with it. So it's it's mm. kind of like, you know, you understand it now, but you don't have to take it. I still don't think if you if you if you're a person who eats meat or chicken, then, you know, you know where it comes from. I mean, it doesn't come from yeah. the supermarket. So, 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 so Myrna, when you were growing up and you had a cold, your mother didn't give you chicken soup for that? Of course, but that had nothing to do with the chicken that was killed. It might <laughs> yes, it not did. help, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't right. hurt, yes. But that chicken was killed, you know. <laughs> but I, as a little kid, I mean, it was a ritual. It was an automatic thing. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I do understand. And of course, all by right. the time my mother coached everything, all the good was taken out of it anyway. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Uh, sure. Shall I go on? Yes, and you're right, okay. Myrna. It was Amos, and it was. It also brought up in Isaiah too, in the right. Psalms, I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. All right. Here we go. This shall be a permanent law for the Israelites and for strangers who reside among you. Those who touch the corpse of any human being shall be impure for seven days. They shall purify themselves with the ashes on the third day and on the seventh day, and then be pure. If day and on the set. I'm sorry. The third day and on the seventh day and then be pure if they fail to purify themselves on the third and seventh day they shall not be pure those who touch a corpse the body the body of a person who has died and do not purify themselves defile the eternal tabernacle those persons shall be cut off from israel since the water of lustration was not dashed on them they remain impure their impurity is still upon them this is the ritual when a person dies in a tent uh, whoever enters the tent and whoever's in the tent shall be impure for seven days. And every open vessel with no lid fastened down shall be impure. And in the open, anyone who touches a person who was killed or who died naturally or human bone or grave shall be impure seven days. Some of the ashes from the fire of purgation shall be taken for the impure person and fresh water shall be added to them in a vessel. Another party who is pure shall take his up, dip in the on the water and sprinkle on the tent and on all the vessels and people who were there or on the one who touched the bones of the person who was killed or died naturally or the grave. The pure person shall sprinkle it upon the impure person on the third day and on the seventh day, thus purifying that person by the seventh day. The one being purified shall then wash the, those clothes and bathe in water and at nightfall shall be pure. If any party who has become impure fails to undergo purification, that person shall be cut off from the congregation, uh, congregation uh, for having defiled the eternity sanctuary. The water of lustration was not dashed on that person who was impure. That shall be for them a law for all time. Further, the one who sprinkled the water of lustration shall wash those clothes, and whoever touches the water of lustration shall be impure until evening. 
Whatever that impure person touches shall be impure. And the person who touches the impure one shall be impure until evening. Before we go on, there's one word that continues coming up, lustration. I think of lust is like person having no, it's got know, no, sexual it's got lust. lust. No, no, it's got, it's got an R, an R in it. So it's not lustation, it's lustration. Oh, okay. What does that mean? That you're using it as, uh, for example, for water of purification will be like holy water. Mm. Okay. The water of lustration is actually the beginning uh, of um, holy water, you know, uh -huh. among Christians. And, and by the way, I got, I got a joke for you guys. Do you know how do you make holy water? No. Well, you take regular tap water and you boil the hell out of it. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. You know what this reminds me of? I wonder in terms of timing when uh, the mikvah came about. Uh, the, the timing the what? When the mikvah. Well, okay. the mikvah is part oh, the of mikvah. purification. Oh, that's, that's different. That's I another know, whole thing. There's a whole tractate in the Talmud about Nita and, 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 and about um, impure and pure. There's a whole tractate in the... I should I should try to get some information for you on that because it's it's a whole book on it. I mean, we're talking a whole... I was just Tahura. curious when that came about. Tahor and not Tame. Right? Yeah, That's right. a good question. I don't know when the, when the mikvah yeah. came about. So, must right. not have been that far along. I should think that the fact that they're washing themselves and being so clean after being with a dead body is just to prevent the spread of any particular germs or illness. I should think that was a, a sanitary problem. Yeah, I think you're right because that's what Dr. Ed and Dr. Michael always say too is that they, there, you know, this this is part of a lot of health. You know, a lot of health yeah. flaws. Some of it was health. Um, I was told, though, that some of it was health, but some of it was just pure spiritual purification. Because when my when my husband used to study Talmud, he explained that to me. I remember him talking about this. That a lot of the things that we all think of, like kosher and everything, is always just for health reasons. There was a spirituality involved. There was a purification, and maybe not the word spirituality is the wrong word, but it was it was purity and purity is not just um for the physical it was um it was it was it's like when you go to the mikvah it's not only just because you're unclean it was supposed to be a spiritual experience that's what i remember him explaining to me Braha, since you are very knowledgeable about this thing can you enlighten us a little bit on this conversation the way i understand it once the soul is out of the body. When the person passes away, then it's tuma. That's why you cannot touch it. Because that body doesn't have the soul in it anymore. So it, I never heard about the germs issue, but it is a fact. Now I understand that. But right. I always, always understood that it's a fact that the soul in a shama has left already yeah but we were also talking about mikvah too and it, and i used to go to mikvah and i remember it was supposed to be not just and because i'm unclean because of you know so many days after my period and everything it was really also a um a, a spiritual purity and yes. that makes it it makes it more of a spiritual experience with your husband yes yes yeah. yes it yes. Makes the, yes. And I remember that. I mean, so, you know, everybody always wants to uh, attach a physical or, or medical reason for some things in the tour. And yes, there, there might have been that as well, but there, I don't think it was only that. That's just my personal opinion, you know. But, you know, and the other thing that is, that's important here, too, is that the body had to be treated with respect. Right. And that's true, too. This, this, yeah. And, and, even today, what are they, the caduceus? What, what is it, what they call it? They prepare the body for burial and there's and the a person that ball. stays with the body too. Yeah, you stay with the that, body. But yes. the, the ones that, there's a group that that specifically you call the on. Hebra Kadesha. You're talking about the Hebra Kadesha. Yeah, right. And that's part of respect. That's part of the preparation. That's right. what has to be done. 
It has to, that has to be, that is connected to purity. Mm. What, what I have trouble understanding here, and I guess I'm not supposed to understand because I'm, I'm reading as I do research that this is supposed to tell me that the precepts that I do not understand, I have to follow as well as I have to follow the ones I do understand. Yes, that's, that's true. Not, that is path. true. It's, it, you know, there's a, a, there's a, a saying that um, the kosher and the mikvah, many things that, you know, you're supposed to do was by the 613 commandments. Some of them are hope. That was a word yes, that my husband... Well, yes, one it's different. a hope. And a hope yeah. means that you just do it. You don't have to know the understanding of it. And you you're just do it. Yeah, it's sur- it's a hope, it's and that's heart. yeah. Because it's I remember my heart. husband explaining that to me too. That especially when it came to Passover, there were so many things to understand. Mm-hmm. He says, "Just do it. Don't try to figure it out." You know. Yeah. You know, it surprised me when I found out that men will go to a mikvah as well. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. It, it's all about purity. That's what I'm trying to tell I know you. It's it, not, but, and yeah. the bridegroom often will go. Yeah, and when you go for your bat mitzvah, a lot of things today. Yeah. All right, where are we? We're all oh. over the place as usual. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Rocket, did you want to add anything else? Because I feel like there was a lot of talking over and over and around and about. But no, uh, um, this is probably the most difficult hook to deal with. The one of, of the red cow, unless okay. you can think of another one. That's right. This. Right. So when you say red cow, and we're going back to the beginning when we talked about the red cow. It's difficult, no matter how you take it. And what I read is that, especially so, so that you will know to follow this one as well as the ones that you do understand. Right. Gotcha. Well, Mike, I, I think that one thing that we need to point out, and I'm, and I'm talking now about the Orthodox rather than uh, anybody else. Uh, the red heifer, mm-hmm. um, yeah. they, they believe that uh, if you have a red heifer that has no blemish whatsoever, mm-hmm. uh, it means that uh, the coming of the Messiah is right around the corner. Oh? Yep. Yeah, they I've heard that. Red. Brian, am I correct? Really red. Yeah, yeah that is true. Not. I've heard that, Michael. Did we have. see something kind of funny? We, I think we saw it together that if one red cow without blemish would they could get so much money for it <laughs> an immense amount of money because they they do not prevail they are not so easy to find right there's not many of them right, right. okay does uh thank you ruthie do you want, myrna you want to pick up on uh, 20. i was going to say i hope you know who we are i think that's where we are. The Israelites Israelites arrived in a body at the wilderness of Zin on the first new moon, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Okay, so if you hold on for just one second, consider the following. After everything that Miriam has done, Mm -hmm. and being a prophetess, and being the one that uh, had a well that people uh, had the water from. Mm. All it says is that Miriam died in Kadesh and was buried there, and that's the end. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought when I saw that too. Is this a case of if, if she were he, this wouldn't be done like that? Great question, great question. But I mean, you know, it has always struck me that uh, having, after all, I mean, you know, remember Miriam was the one that um, saved um, Moses. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in later on, it's going to say the community was without water. In other words, after Miriam died, the Mi- Miriam's well dried up. Right. And all we have is Miriam died there, meaning Kadesh, mm-hmm. and was buried there. And that's the end of that you know, before I forget, I, I wanted to mention one thing. We talked about the, the Indians, the indigenous people. Uh, they would, do, they had a, like a, a tent or whatever of where people went until they were clean and purified and could come back into the group. So they had the same 
kind of thing of purification as we did. Michael, you're thinking. That sounds good. Now you know where they got it from. Yeah, we're going to find out where they got it from, though. It might have been from... No, I just remember being amazed when, you know, you read a book about, uh, most of the time it would be a novel, about what was going on and how they went to be clean. And they also had, I don't know what they were inhaling, but they'd have these dreams that kind of guided them thereafter. I think I think they got it from TTS and Peabody. Okay. <laughs> okay. There is one thing we need to we need to note that after Miriam passed away, there was no water. Right. Yeah, we talked about right. that. Right. The the well the well dried. Well dried up. Yeah. There was no water for the community. And, and so that's, what the people that, do, yeah. they congregate. And, 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 and they that's that. And actually, that, that's what's coming. The community was without water. That'll teach them not to have given her a better send-off. <laughs> that's why we have the cup of Miriam and the Seder. Right, we have to she's remember Miriam. She's associated with water, though. Maya, 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 Maya. Hey, Maya. <laughs> Maya yeah, that's cool. The community was without water, and they and joined they, against Moses and Aaron. They, uh-huh. The people quarreled with Moses, saying, if only we had perished when our brothers perished at the instance of the Eternal. Why have you brought the Eternal's congregation into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die there? Why did you make us leave Egypt to bring us to this wretched place, a place with no grain or figs or vines or pomegranates? There is not even water to drink. Me, me, me. Yeah. <laughs> Moses Here goes the complaining again. away from the congregation to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. The presence of the Eternal appeared to them, and the Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, You and your brother Aaron take the rod and assemble the community, and before their very eyes, order the rock to yield its water. Thus you shall produce water for them from the rock, and provide drink for the congregation and their beasts. Moses took the rod from before the Eternal as he had been commanded. Moses and Aaron assembled the congregation in front of the rock and he said to them, listen you rebels, shall we get water for you out of this rock? And Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Out came copious water and the community and their beasts drank. Yippee! But the Eternal One said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to affirm my sanctity in the sight of the Israelite people, therefore you shall not lead this congregation into the land that I have given them. Those are the waters of Meribah, meaning that the Israelites quarreled with the Eternal, whose sanctity was affirmed through them. From Kadesh, Moses sent messengers to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardships that have befallen us, that our ancestors went down to Egypt, that we dwelt in Egypt a long time, and that the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our ancestors. We cried to the Eternal who heard our plea, sending a messenger who freed us from Egypt. Now we are in Kadesh the town on the border of your territory. Allow us then to cross your country. Oh, Gary, did you want to mention something about the striking the rock? No, just I, you know, well, there's a few things in here. I mean, like a lot of people start talking about, oh, you know, Moses got punished so harshly for like, what did he do that's so terrible? But it's kind of um, it's kind of like a number of things. First of all, well, God told him to talk to the rock, and I think God, you know, it was an opportunity for Moses to show God's power through talking to the rock, like right. for God to provide the water. So instead, he says, you know, shall we, you rebels, shall we? The other the other thing was. Um, when you're in a position of leadership, you held to a much higher standard. Right. And Moses, you know, he lost his cool. He's, he, he called the people rebels, which 
throughout the Torah. We know many times they're always rebel, rebellious, and fetching. But not having water is not an invalid thing to fetch about. That's a valid thing. Well, so it's a number of, this... of things. It's it, it's it's the fact that he um, it it shows some poor leadership, mm. and there again he's saying, "Shall we get the water?" So he's making it seem almost like him and Aaron are performing this miracle instead yeah. of God. But, but I think okay, but I think that there is an inconsistency here. When we were in the Sea of Reeds, God said to Moses touch the water with your rod and then the waters parted mm. so now Moses says well if I touch the waters with my rod I'm going to touch the stone with my rod too what's wrong with that I don't but think God he didn't tell God specifically God specifically told him to speak to the rock well, this can time we, can we, right can we, back, can we go back to that paragraph where okay okay but he did this in anger and and he was supposed to give the credit to God that God was doing this. And he All said, right, so let's, let, let, let's read. You uh, and your uh, brother Aaron. All right, we're going to get back to you, Myrna. Hang on, hang on to your okay. thought. Where okay. was I? All right. You and your brother, you, you and your brother Aaron, take the rod, take the rod. Right. And now assemble speak. the community. It doesn't say speak, it says you take the rod and assemble the community. And before they rise and order the rock. Well, so I can say I'm ordering the rock with my rod. I'm ordering the rock to provide to provide water with my rod. Because it says take your rod. Well, he 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 interpreted it his way. <laughs> God didn't want me no, to but do I'm, that. I'm, I'm just saying that it is not as clear as you might think it is. Mm. In other words, that uh, you know, you can say, Well, God said to Moses, speak to the rod. Ah, I'm sorry, speak to the rock. And then Moses uh, disagreed, or uh, you know, didn't follow instructions, and struck the rock, the rock with a rod. But God said, "Take the rod." So if you take the rod, then what the hell are you want? Why do you want me to talk to the rod? I'm going to do something with it. Doctor Mike, may I interrupt you? Sure. <laughs> Doctor Mike, I have here. Okay, you can translate. Háblale a la roca a la vista de ellos, y ella dará sus aguas. Speak to the rock with them present, and she, meaning the rock, will give its waters. Mm -hmm. It says, háblale. Okay, speak so in Spanish, rock. okay, in that translation, it says, speak to the rod, to, to, to the mm -hmm. rock. But where does the rod come from? Tell Here, me. it says, okay, may I read it to you? Yeah, please, it's, go ahead. But tell, it tell says, me about the rod, the rod. It says, toma el baston, which is ah, el baston. rod. El baston y reúne, is the rod. Y reúne a la comunidad. Tú oh, right. y tu hermano, so, Aaron. Y okay, so háblale. Both, both in English and in the Spanish translation. Y háblale God, a la roca. God take says, the rock, take take the the rock, rock. and speak to the rock. <laughs> guys just make sure let's just make sure we're not talking over each other a lot because it's hard to understand sometimes mm. on zoom so go ahead Baraka, keep going and then dr michael please yeah uh i have here take the rock the rod but talk to, talk to the rock both and that's it's, in this verse in i think verses. that the the important thing is we need to explore what is it that hashem wanted what did what would have been the the appropriate action in hashem's eyes this is what always guides what i'm what i'm thinking what is good in hashem's eyes did hashem want what did hashem want what would have been right to do and, well, and then hashem says that I, let, let, your trust all right so let, 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 let me give you my take Okay. God, God should have said, go to the rock and speak to the rock. Fine. But it doesn't say that. It says, take the rock. Hmm. And then it says, speak to the rock. So why, where does the rock come from? The rock come from? So assemble the, the people. Yeah, assemble the people. And, um, and also, well, Myrna, you were mentioning the anger part, too. Let's right. talk about the anger part, Myrna. What were you going to add for the anger Well, part? no, this, this is 
was something that really um it showed that that he had lost Moses had lost his temper and he he smote that rock in anger and you know he really went at it and this is not what God wanted him to do now I know the confusion of the rod but maybe it was to assemble the people you know follow me um but he wasn't supposed to do any of this in anger and this kind of it goes against what God really wanted him to do right. and it you doesn't know, give credit to God that's a good point I was going to bring up that point like it and when when Moses brought down the tablets he obviously said these, these are these are you know the ten commandments are from God to you the people and in this way too we might be able to draw that same conclusion that God is giving us water another way possibly mm -hmm. for for us to remember and trust who said trust right. Raka? yeah trust right trust that that God is not going to just allow people to perish in the in the wilderness because God says you failed to sanctify me before the yeah. sanctify yes so interesting well you know oh. it they're always oh. pushing God's buttons, and this time they did that. What were you going to say, Brock? How did we not obey Hashem here? I know that it says that if even the rock was going to give out its water because Hashem had ordered it, and then something we failed to do, what was that? That's what I want us to explore. What did where did we not do the right thing? The rock was ready to give out its water. What did what did we fail? Because because Moshe Rabbeinu uh, uh, hit it twice because there was that showed lack of trust, lack of emuna in Hashem. Is that what it is? Because we should have known that if we ask for it, Hashem will give it to us. Is that it? It's a good question. I think it's because I think it's because Moses, as Myrna said, he did it in anger. First of all, um, and second of all, like you say, Rafa, he had a chance to, like, if he talked to the rock, like, and said, or you know, talk to God and said, God, you know, talk to the rock and said, let God bring forth, or something like that, that made it look. But instead, he's like, shall all right, ye rebels, right. shall we bring forth water? And he, Moses hits it like he himself is like making this miracle happen. He loses patience. So, yeah, he, he loses patience, but, and he he took he lost an opportunity. I think God wanted him to use that as an opportunity to show trust, right. and instead he did he didn't. I don't see any paradox by having the rod and also having to speak because there was something of of power given by Hashem in that rod. So holding the rod, you would speak to the rock and that would have gotten it. That would have been what Hashem wanted. That would have been the trust in Hashem. Have the rod in your hand and then speak to the rock. Like knowing that this is Hashem doing it. You are, you are following Hashem's orders, Hashem's commandments. But, you know, we have to look at Moses as a human being, and he lost right. his patience. He lost and, his patience. Right, and so he reacted, uh, you know, come on, with all the things that God's done to you, look at how you, you know, you, how you treat him, and this is terrible. And he never should have reacted that way, but, but he was human. He wasn't right. God. But he should have, uh, it was the element of compassion. These people have been slaves. And these people have gone through a whole lot. So they're not going to have the, the best refinement, the best midot, the best middles. So it happens over and over that they complain. Mm -hmm. And Moshe Rabbeinu this time really lost his patience. Right, and and the irony is like he loses his patience like this time, when what they're complaining about is something valid. You know, it's True. not like they're just fetching because they need water. I mean, you don't live too long without water in the desert or anywhere right. else for that matter. But I think God wanted them to realize that 
he has taken them, brought them so far, he's not going to abandon them. And you, they should have known that. They should have recognized right. that. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. We all should. Yes. yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank yes. you. <laughs> And I, I just just to kind of wrap up our discussion here, because every time we go through this passage, I'm sure we're going to have similar conversations. And in, in, um, but I will bring you down to the commentary below. And uh, it says here that Bible critics take uh, this some of this because there's so much so many so many conversations about this one incident incident. Right. Because it does mm. cause Moses not to go in. Look at down here at the bottom here. Bible critics take this discrepancy as support for the idea that the story originally had been somewhat different. They suggest that the leaders, meaning Moses and Aaron, committed some serious sin that was later edited away. So really, no, no one's yeah, So you can imagine like people's imaginations are like, well, is that really is that really a serious enough sin so that they don't aren't able to cross into the, the promised land? Who knows? I mean, it's so it's it's all it, as Ruthie likes to point out. It's just all one big lesson. Yeah. It's all a big mm. lesson. Always. I think it's. I've always thought of it too as um, part of. I think God was looking for something too to, like Moses was the right leader to take him out of Egypt, mm. but he wasn't the right leader to wean them off of needing his leadership and to get them into the new land so i think that's part of it too i think that maybe you know god figured out you know he's kind of losing it and i told him to do this and he did it this way he's not the guy that's going to lead him when they get in here so i can use this to mm -hmm. yeah. use this because before that you know there was the golden calf with Aaron. I mean, that's why Aaron didn't get to go in either you know this always surprised me though that um I, I used to think that the bigger sin was breaking the Ten Commandments, the, the, you know, the, the tablets and throwing them down. You don't deserve this. I thought that was an even bigger sin than this, but he doesn't get, get into um, cross the, to the promised land because of this, because he lost his temper. Didn't you Maybe think it's the he lost his temperature though. with the tablets breaking them? It's the culmination, I think. He did that, he did this. There was the golden calf. That's why the two of them don't get to go in. Yeah. It's, it's, well, I guess he had to have a, a, a verbal reason so that they would understand. He wasn't going my, to go in anyway. My two cents worth in this whole discussion, because I've been listening to everything everyone has to say, is that everything in Torah is a lesson. And I believe that if everything was done right, and you know, like and Moses did talk to the rock and he didn't get, that we wouldn't learn from this. So I believe everything is a lesson. That's all I look, get out of this whole thing. And we wouldn't have lessons. these great discussions. We wouldn't have these great discussions. That's either. right. I mean, we have to <laughs> it's learn. It's from that. all the imperfections that we learn perfection. That's right. And, and, that, and we learn from being, like, like, what Myrna said was right. Moses was human. He said, after all this, he got frustrated and he hit the right. rock. And that's it. I mean, I, I don't see it as a big discussion. I just see it as a lesson. That's just me. But maybe I simplify things too much. That oh, might excellent. be my problem. <laughs> Thank you, Myrna. Cynthia, would you like to pick it up? Sure. Uh, we will. 14, is it? So, uh, yeah, well, we did read this part. So uh, they're going to enter. They want to just pass through. Uh, Edom. So uh, we're down. We actually read, uh, Myrna brought us to the. So Moses is asking the king of Edom to cross through their country. That's all they want to do. See, see what happens. So we will. Okay. So uh, for, from Kadesh, is that where you want me to begin? I had difficulty for, hearing uh, you. 17. Number 17. Oh, 17. Okay. Allow us then to cross your country. We will not pass through fields of vineyards and we will not drink water from wells we'll follow the king's highway turning off neither to the right nor to the left until we have crossed your territory but edern answered him you shall not pass through us else we will go out against you with the sword we will keep to the have beaten track the israelites said to them and if we or our cattle drink your water we will pay for it we ask only for passage on foot it is but a small matter. But they replied, you shall not pass through 
and Edom went out against them in heavy force, strongly armed. So Edom would not let Israel cross their territory, and Israel turned away from them. Setting out from Kadesh, the Israelites arrived in a body at Mount Hor. At Mount Hor, on the boundary of the land of Edom, the Eternal One said to Moses and Aaron, Let Aaron be gathered to his kin. He is not to enter the land that I have assigned to the Israelite people, because you disobeyed my command about the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and his son Eliezer and bring them up on Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his vestments and put them on his son Eliezer. There Aaron shall be gathered unto the dead. Moses did as the Eternal had commanded. They ascended Moses Mount Hor in the sight of the whole community. Moses stripped Aaron of his vestments and put on them on his son Eliezer, and Aaron died there on the summit of the mountain. When Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain, the whole community knew that Aaron had breathed his last. All the house of Israel bewailed Aaron thirty days. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who dwelt in the Negev, learned that, learned that Israel was coming by way of Atharim, he engaged Israel in battle and took some of them captive. Then Israel made a vow to the Eternal and said, if you deliver this people into our hand, we, you will prescribe their towns. The Eternal heeded Israel's plea and delivered up the Canaanites, and they and their cities were proscribed. So that place was named Horba. May I just ask the question, we, we killed off poor Aaron, and it doesn't sound like anybody buried him. It's like he just died there and that was it. Shouldn't he have been honored with the, the whole thing with the you know burial kind of thing doesn't say anything it's not really a very nice way to end something i thought they mourned for 30 yeah, days 30 days they felt terrible about him it was poor miriam but, but they, yeah, left, poor they left her him they said they left him and went on i i i don't 30 days of mourning but what did they do with the body who knows we don't even know what happened to moses never mind Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> or miriam wasn't he okay. buried on Mount Hor? He said you should be gathered among your people. It's a, it's, yeah, it's tragedy. Those are the good old days. <laughs> All right, where are we? Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> we're at four, right? Yeah. Yeah. Should I go on or? Yes, please. Oh, okay. They set out from Mount Hor by way of the Sea of Reeds to skirt the land of Edom, but the people grew restive on the journey. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why did you make us leave Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread and no water, and we have come to loathe this miserable food. The Eternal sent seraph serpents against the people. They bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. Oh, the yeah, people... <laughs> like mosquitoes. <laughs> you get the killed. People came to Moses and said, We sinned by speaking against the eternal and against you, intercede with the eternal to take away the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the eternal one said to Moses, make a seraph figure and mount it on a standard. And anyone who is bitten, who then looks at it shall recover. Moses made a copper serpent and mounted it on a standard. And when bitten by a serpent, anyone who looked at the copper serpent would recover. The Israelites marched on and encamped at Oboth. They set out from Oboth and encamped at Lya Abari in the wilderness bordering on Moab to the east. From there they set out and encamped on the Wadi Zered. From there they set out and encamped beyond the Arnon that is in the wilderness that extends from the territory of the Amorites. For the Arnon is the boundary of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore, the book of the wars of the eternal speaks of Wahab and Sufa, and the wadis, the Amor, with its tributary wadis stretched along the settled country of Ar, hugging the territory of Moab. It's interesting that this is all so detailed, that they have all the details down here. And from there to Beer, which is the well. Yeah, and also the book of wars of the eternal. I'm, I don't remember seeing that. The Book of, of the Wars of the Eternal. That's a book somewhere? 
I have a question. Going back, when uh, God said, make a, 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 a Sarah figure, an angel, and mount it on a standard, that to me is like almost like worshiping a, a symbol of, you know, for a, a God. I, I, that bothers me. I mean, Aaron what if was God a, tells was you a, to do interesting. it. Interesting. Right. Uh, Aaron was a, a, a maker of gods. I mean, because no graven image, and that's sort of like an image of sorts. But yes. God's not saying to worship it or anything. He's just saying, look at no, it. No, but recover. it's the next thing to it. It's like medicine. We have, we have items, we have objects in the sanctuary that are, you know, you stand up when the Torah ark is opened or when you're in the presence of the Torah. That's not an idol. It's conducive to worship. Just like this thing is conducive to recovering, but God's not saying to worship it or anything. He's just saying that if you look at it, it's just like a cure for. You know. Remember, remember that that's the. Yeah, that's. What is that? We, that's, isn't that what they use for medicine? That's what they use for the medicine. That's what's very interesting yeah. the healing. So isn't it interesting that they? But that's use that probably medicine. where it comes from. Then that's where it's it comes from. from. Okay. Okay, I've learned something new tonight. <laughs> Michael, remember we talked about this thing a year ago? A year ago, I do remember. Yeah. <laughs> Short-term memory is the first to go in mine. Is <laughs> it, does, it does not say to make a sculpture. It says to take the figure of this the snake and put it on a kind of rod again. The Spanish is masteel. I don't know what it would be in English. It's a kind of stick, and then you would put the copper serpent figure on it. But it's not a sculpture. But it doesn't say that. It says make a seraph figure, and seraph to me is an angel. Seraph? Yeah. Okay, oh. so that's different from what I'm reading. <clears throat> seraph? Is that right? The seraph is an angel? Well, yeah. yeah the seraphim? seraphim? Yeah, seraphim is seraphim. angel. And in fact, Michael, you remember that there are two seraphim on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Right. With their with wow. their wings touching. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So does anybody have a reason as to why God said to do this? I I don't think that anybody's got a logical explanation. Right. And on the other hand, how would they know what a seraph looks like? Well, well, well but the, the the other thing too that that really doesn't make any sense. You have been bitten by serpents. Mm. And when you look at a copper um, serpent, you're going to get better. Does that make sense to anybody? It, it's, Isn't this it fun? Works? We have okay. challenges. <laughs> if it works, it makes sense to me. It's totally, <laughs> anything that works is medicine. Okay. If it, works. Well, it must have made sense to God. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the other thing too is, you know, from a medical perspective, so let's get into medicine here for a minute, you know, given the fact that Michael brought up the caduceus. If a serpent bites you, the problem is that uh, you get your get blood poisoning. Okay. Infected. The um, a serpent doesn't infect you. A serpent bites you in order to uh, coagulate your blood and then the serpent actually can take you so this whole thing in here really truly makes no sense whatsoever from a medical point of view it makes no sense but it isn't interesting from a medical point of view from this from this bible story okay this this homa story that now we use that symbol in medicine for healing oh well as, as a matter of fact it isn't just from here um, all throughout the Middle East, <clears throat> serpent were considered to be a heal. You know that the, the, there was a serpent god, and that was the god of healing. Oh, interesting. Wow. But it's interesting that it ended up in in regular secular world now. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Oh, right. no question about that. Yeah. Right. I think the caduceus actually came from the time that we. Um, Greeks, Hippocrates, uh, who was in that, that particular time. And I think that's when we first saw the Caduceus. Well, well I said, my, 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 Michael, if you hold on for a second, 
if you take a look at uh, the 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 big picture that you've got is so you've got two intertwining serpents mm -hmm. that is the medicine uh, of uh, th this this is the symbol of the american uh, our, um, medical core but if you go back to the one that you have a lot of little pictures mm. okay if you take a look at the, the third one down on the left there's only one serpent and that was the original original one that see see that one already asclepius asclepius as you know was the um doctor of the the the, the um, father of medicine yeah. as far as the uh, greeks were concerned so right. that is the rod of asclepius it says that asclepius medical symbol okay exactly right and asclepius was a physician i know but my husband's didn't look like that his caduceus looks like that. And I do? <laughs> I assume not. But what about this? If you if you meditate on that symbol, right? If we think about meditation and we think about how our insides kind of are laid out in the way that they're laid out, do you do you see any of our insides that mm. might be that way? The God, insides, Michael, I hope not. I mean, it doesn't our intestines kind of look this oh, way yeah. somewhat, or our hearts, or, like that. or just the veins? I mean, I don't know. I'm just thinking that it might, there might have, there might have some metaphysical properties to it, which we, if we meditate on it, maybe, maybe there is some healing in it. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out. If you go down a little tiny bit, you know, in the uh, blue, yeah, right, the the, the one in the center, uh, it, that, that is from the United Nations. So the, the one in the blue with uh, the globe, that's from the United, the, the, below that one. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah, that one right there. Mm. Oh, wow. Isn't it strange how much, uh, uh, how many times are the serpents come oh, out? Oh, oh, oh. So everybody knows what HWO stands for? World Health Organization. World Health Organization. Oh, yeah. Yay, go. Cynthia, we're going to give you a prize at the end of this. You oh, good. I hope it's monetary. <laughs> I could use it. And, 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 and Cynthia. Yeah, it's a new car. That's <laughs> right. AMA. What does that mean? American sorry, Medical. American AMA. Medical Association. Oh, yeah. AMA. Sure. Even that I even knew. Stop the quiz right there, though. I've run out of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> American Meshuggah Association. Yeah, I I started that. To go back go back with that the serpents that i was thinking of cleopatra oh. and how she committed suicide with the serpent did she wow so they really played a big role in, in the ancient world absolutely mm. that's wild stuff all right where were we oh my who knows God. oh here we are uh oh 16 who would like to pick it up at six thanks so much cynthia how about Bracha? Would you like to start yes. 16? And from there to there, which is the well where the Eternal One said to Moses, assemble the people that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up a well, sing to it. The well which the chieftains dug, which the nobles of the people started, with maces with their own staffs. And from Midbar to Matana, and from Matana to Nahatel, and from Nahalel to Bamoth, and from Bamoth to the valley that is in the country of Moab, at the peak of Pisgah, overlooking the wasteland. Israel now sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your country, we will not turn off into fields or vineyards, and we will not drink water from wells. We will follow the king's highway until we have crossed your territory. But Sihon would not let Israel pass through his territory. Sihon gathered all his troops and went out against Israel in the wilderness. He came to Jahaz and engaged Israel in battle. But Israel put them to the sword and took possession of their land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, as far as As of the Ammonites, for As marked the boundary of the Ammonites. Israel took all those towns 
and Israel settled in all the towns of the Amorites, in Heshbon and all its dependencies. Now Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land from him as far as the Arnon. Arnon. Therefore, the bards would recite, Come to Heshbon, firmly built and well founded in Sihon's city, for fire went forth from Heshbon, flame from Sihon's city, consuming Ar of Moab, the lords of Bamoth by the Ammon, Arnon. Woe to you, O Moab, you are undone, O people of Shemosh. His sons are rendered fugitive, and his daughters captive by an Amorite king, Sihon. Yet we have cast them down utterly. Heshbon along with Dibon, we have wrought desolation at Nopha, which is hard by Medeba. So Israel occupied the land of the Amorites. Then Moses sent to spy out Jasser, and they captured its dependencies and dispossessed the Amorites who were there. They marched on and went up the road to Bashan, and King Og of Bashan, with all his troops, came out to Edre to engage them in battle. But the Eternal One said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I give him and all his troops and his land unto your hand. You shall do to him as you did to Zihon, king of the Amorites who dwelt in Heshbon. They defeated him and his sons and all his troops until no remnant was left him, and they took possession of his country. The Israelites then marched on and encamped in the steppes of Moab across the Jordan from Jericho. Amen. Bravo. Bravo. Well, Mike, I think that, when, you know, now that we have finished uh, the Parsha, <clears throat> I think that we, we need to think back a little bit. Mount Hor, H-O-R, uh, is another name for Mount Sinai. Oh. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. So actually, they're, they're interchangeable in the Bible. <clears throat> so the thing that I wanted to point out is that Aaron died on Mount Sinai or Mount Hor. I like the name Sinai better. <laughs> That's why I said H O R. <laughs> <laughs> well, Good thanks morning. again. This is great. This is the second time we read this as a group, and there's always something interesting to talk about. Every it'll every always time. be interesting, no matter how many times we do this. It's true. <laughs> it's true. And this is the thing that I shared with Gary something that I did not I did not know about was um, the group, um, the Chabad Rebbe. Rebbe uh Menachem Schneerson uh, of blessed memory oh, yeah. his, his ER site was this week but also in 1984 he designed a program where people could read Maimonides and tell me oh, if yeah Maimonides. 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 Maimonides the whole um Maimonides whole take on Torah which was several it's it's, it's huge and so he uh, created a program where people could do this and they've they've completed it. They do it every year. They have to read three chapters and they're pretty long chapters and they've done it now for 42 years. And in last week and this this week begins a new year and last week, they just concluded their 42nd year. And I was just talking to Gary about it. How did we conclude? We concluded our first year <laughs> last week. <laughs> It's just, it's, we didn't, not by design, not by plan. How does it work? I, you know, but somebody's design, right? Divine, divine guidance. Beshert, beshert, beshert. You know what I found interesting today, and I'm not going to remember her name, but there's a movie that's based on a play that's opening up that a combination of um, Puerto Ricans and, you know, Latins, and you know what it is, but something about heights. Reach. In the heights, yeah, in the right. heights. That's, uh, so the woman who's written that book and who's in it was beautiful. And she was saying that her father was Jewish, a Cuban Jew, and her mother was from Puerto Rico. And she didn't really know much about, you know, the, the tradition or her father's especially. So she was learning about it. 
I just thought that was quite interesting. She said, I really didn't know that much about either of them, but I think Puerto Rico was so, you know, the, the, there were so many more people in the area. So she knew that, but she said she's made it her business to go back and learn more about both of them. Two beautiful women. Okay, so, was, I, I, so I think that we can say that she is a Jurican. <laughs> so what is the movie called? Or In the Heights. Heights. Oh yeah, that's it. So that that woman with the is that who it is? The one with the red. She's with that other guy from. Um, oh, Lin Manuel Miranda. Yeah, Lin. Oh, right. I love him. Oh my God, I love yeah. him. Yeah, he's they, great. they were together, I think, weren't they? In yeah. uh, he he's it? fabulous. I, everything he does is fabulous. Mm -hmm. In the Heights. Yeah, isn't she attractive though? Yes, she is. Yes, she was very, very That's talkative. Funny. I mean, yeah. very lovely. So she grew up in, did she grow up in New York or did she grow up? In, I think so. Yeah. yeah she, well, in the Heights has to do with New York. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, is it, what is it? Uh, what's the name of the Heights? Uh, I can't think of the name, the Heights. But it's something Heights, Washington Heights, something. Washington Heights. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's, that's a, very, a right that's there. A bit, Washington Heights is where my, my, that's where my husband's relatives are from in the no, but Washington the, Heights. The theory. actual ad for the, the movie, see it? Oh, right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in the Heights, yeah. Wow. Yeah, the, the movie, so they, it was a Broadway musical for years, right? And right. Then, but and then they just the put a movie out. It. There's a book. And evidently, the, the two of them um, had been, well, they've been together for, for several productions. They're so talented. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Incredible. very talented people. Yeah. Yeah. But Michael, no, Michael Zeiter, her name is looks to me like somebody from Puerto Rico. And yet it's her father who was a Cuban Jew. Is that a name that would be found like that in in uh, Cuba? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, what, what what is the name again? Well, you can see it. Um, I'm not gonna pronounce it. Okay, Alegria. Yeah. Yes. Alegria means- Now her father is the one who was a Cuban Jew. Happiness. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay, Alegria in Spanish means happiness. Oh, and what about the last name? Who uh, yeah. That one, I don't know. Hmm. <clears throat> that one, I don't know. She's very Who this bright. is her last name? Who this, yeah. Who this? Who this, I, I don't know. She's <clears throat> very charming, too. The first name is Chiara. Yeah. Alegria Which... is the middle name. Uh, in Spanish, I, I, I'm Braja, Braja, you know, maybe you can um, chime in. I have never seen the name Chiara before i haven't either nope. so maybe that's something maybe her mother wanted oh, to yeah. do I, I would think so. oh that's possible yeah. i am trying to think of who this if that would be sephardic or it would be ashkenazi good question i don't know hmm. <clears throat> to read this background does it sound like querida a little bit? Yeah. Querida. A little bit. Well, querida means beloved. You will, um, yeah, or desire, like, you know, say take quiero. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. quiero means I love you. You say te amo, you say take quiero. Right? Oh, te, 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 te ah. it's I love you. Yeah, but I'm saying like, quiero. Something like I, I like you or something like that. Yeah, 